probably needs no introduction to most people, but uh, it's, a, of course, a great pleasure and a tremendous honor to welcome back a dear uh, and uh, revered colleague, Dolph Seilocker. Professor Dolph Seilocker, uh, as I've told some of you before, has been a lifelong a hero of mine. Uh, he related to me last night that his first paper was written 66 years ago in 1943. If you stop to think about what was happening in Germany in 1943 and the fact that Dolph was maybe 17, 18 years old at the time, you realize that he was a remarkable individual from the very outset of his career. And it's been quite a career. He uh, studied under the uh, eminent paleontologist Otto Schindewolf at Tübingen Univers University in Germany and received a PhD in 1951, an important year for me too. <laughs> and and uh, he taught briefly at the University of Frankfurt in Germany and then also uh, in uh, Baghdad in Iraq. Uh, before coming back to his uh, old institution at Tübingen and uh, being the follow-on to his uh, illustrious mentor. There he was for many years until he officially retired and I must tell you uh, we began many uh, fun field trips and lots of communication about that time. I think it was 1987 he first came to Yale University, and then he's been splitting his time between Germany and Yale each fall, coming back uh, for 23 years since his official retirement. And a tremendous lot of new and exciting stuff has come out in that time, too. Dolph, of course, is a world-renowned paleontologist, possibly one of the most eminent paleontologists on the planet, certainly, uh, in, in my view, he, he is, uh, with many papers and numerous awards, but I'll only give you one little anecdote, which is indicative of the stature that he has. One day in uh, 1992, I, I called him up and said, you know, Dolph, I'm having a field trip in the Finger Lakes area, and he always liked to bring the class out. So I said, well, this next weekend, I hope you can, can come. And he said, well, I'm very sorry, Carl, but I have to go to Sweden to receive the Nobel Prize. I said, well, you are Dolph. A, a, my, a freshman student could come up with a better excuse than that because you know there's no Nobel Prize in geology. But <laughs> then he went on to explain, no, but he was to receive the Crawford Prize, which for a geologist, paleontologist, is as close to the Nobel Prize as you can get. So, yeah, okay, we let him off the hook. <laughs> that year. But he came back again. So, I mean, he's done an amazing amount of things. He, He's often thought of as the father of trace fossils. He did his dissertation on that uh, wonderful set of fossils, even in spite of the objections of some people who said, that's not much of a field to go into. There's no future to that. Of course, Dolph, as usual, showed him to be wrong. And he's gone on to make many contributions, not only in the field of trace fossils, but as you know, probably, in areas of constructional morphology, functional morphology, taphonomy, event stratigraphy, and evolution, which you'll talk about uh, today. And, and of course, I think uh, he's also become very uh, well known for his radical views on the Ediacaran faunas, which have really opened up a whole new world in terms of the way we look at those odd fossils uh, from, from that last part of the Proterozoic. So, uh, without much further ado, today Dolph's going to talk about uh, an interesting subject, not one that I would have guessed, but uh, one that sounds fascinating, on the macroevolution of the deep sea, a kind of an interesting environment, sometimes we think of it as a sheltered environment, rather stressed, but it turns out that it's quite dynamic, and you'll hear more on that. So, let me welcome you, Dolph, uh, very, very hard. Uh, let me say in the beginning that I'm very happy to be back in Cincinnati at the age of 84. You think it may be the last visit? Uh, my first visit was 
1955 when I came by Greyhound bus from California on the way to New York to catch a boat in New York. It was still the old building. Uh, it, it was already the dry dredgers and Ken Caster. And so through the years with Osgood as a, as a uh, trace fossil worker here, uh, I always had a very good connection with uh, this and of course with this department and of course with Carl being here after we had the contact in his Rochester time. And he is one of the model cases of a paleontologist that I think we would need more of them, uh, field geologist and geologist at the same time as, as a paleontologist. Now I have a third mission here and that's very strange. You know the name Seilacher is so rare that in Germany it does not exist beyond my immediate family, my an uncle whose name is died out and my offspring and their offspring and a family reunion are all the silos in the world, I thought. <laughs> but strangely uh, our children more at home in the internet found out that there is a Seilacher family and some Seilachers in only one telephone book and that's Cincinnati. <laughs> and we know the family record 500 years back but I have not found anybody that was going to America. Probably he was a non-fit, one of these revolutionary <laughs> people uh, that were sent out to America. <laughs> Is by any chance any Seilacher here? Sorry, it did not work. They got the invitation. Mm -hmm. But you can imagine how exciting this was for me, so I have to use the telephone uh, after all, because uh, that's like discovering relatives on another star. <laughs> okay, uh, now we have the Darwin year, and that is a challenge to everybody. What can we say about Darwin and evolutionary theory? And uh, th there is not much to say except that paleontologists, after a long time, fully embraced the Darwinian theory, and we are happy with his explanation of the Darwinian process. Now, what can paleontology contribute? Of course, the only thing, we have much less detailed information, but we have the time, that the evolutionary time in which this whole thing, evolution, took place. And in this, we observe patterns that a bi biologist could never observe and that is what I call macroevolution. Now, macroevolution, as I define it, means no, uh, means the modulation of the microevolutionary process as described by Darwin in the long range and on a global basis, not individual small environments, but global changes modulating the ever increasing tree, bush or whatever 